what are some of the values of compliance? How about your life? <laughs> <laughs> Consideration for people who care for you. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode 26 of the Removing Barriers podcast. In this episode, we will be discussing the circumstances around the shooting of Jacob Blake and also look into the importance of compliance in this incident. How would compliance have changed the situation with Jacob Blake and many others? We'll start by discussing the incident, then whether his background is fair game in this situation. Join us as we discuss Jacob Blake and the value of compliance. So Jay, let's get into it. Who is Jacob Blake? And what do we know about the situation? Jacob Blake is a 29-year-old man, originally from North Carolina, but he moved to Illinois Evanston, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. His family says he moved there for a fresh start. When he was in high school, he was on the wrestling team. And not too long after that, he moved to Evanston, Illinois for a fresh start. His grandfather, of whom he's the namesake, was a pastor and an activist during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. He fought to end racial discrimination in housing in his city and was successful. This led to a ban in racial discrimination in housing. But he himself is a father of six children. That is the last that I've seen updated online. And on the 23rd of August, 2020, he was involved in a domestic police call and was subsequently shot as a result of his interaction with the police. His shooting has left him paralyzed from the waist down. And it has been a lightning rod to galvanize the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as others who have anti-police or defund the police sentiment. We know that he was at a place where he was not authorized to be, so he was trespassing. We know that it was the woman in the house who called the police on him. We know that there was an initial scuffle with the police in which he was tased and that was unsuccessful. And we know that he went into his car ignoring police orders to stop or to freeze or whatever verbiage they used. He went into his car and retrieved a weapon, which we later found out to be a knife. I think they said that he had the knife in his hand already. I don't think he actually got it from the car. Oh, he already had it in his hand. I didn't realize that. Wow. Depends on what news source you said. It seems like he had it in his hand initially. So I'm not sure what he retrieved from the car, but he did have the knife in his hand or he retrieved the knife from the car. Any which way, he had a knife. He had a weapon. He had a knife. We know that the officer that shot him grabbed his shirt and shot seven times, four of which hit him. And those four bullets severed his spinal cord, caused some internal damage in his stomach and liver and intestines. And now he is paralyzed from the waist down, although doctors are not entirely sure it's permanent. But as of right now, he's paralyzed from the waist down. And we know that this shooting, this police encounter has sparked protest nationwide and has also led to a subsequent situation that involves one named Cal Rittenhouse, which is a different situation we're not going to deal with here. But that's what we know about the Jacob Blake situation. Does his background come into play here? We know that he had warrants out for his arrest. Of course, he was violating a restraining orders by being where he was at that point. And the dispatcher told the officers that someone at this address has a warrant over their arrest. Of course, he was charged for third degree sexual assault, does his background come into play in the discussion of whether or not this was justified or the overuse of force on the behalf of police officers at this point? This is a difficult one for me. And though I'm not 
100% committed to this, I do say, yes, his background has to come into play. In addition to that felony third degree sexual assault charge that he had a warrant out for his arrest for, he also had charges back in 2015 that were dropped in 2018 where he was charged with resisting an officer, disorderly conduct, and multiple handgun charges resulting with that particular issue that I think that happened in a bar or something back in 2015. So for the officer responding, this demonstrates someone who, for all that he knows as an officer, is unlikely to comply and therefore is a threat to his life. And so as an officer, I know I would think this way, I would approach it with extreme caution or at least with a heightened awareness that, okay, this is potentially a dangerous person that I'm dealing with. So yes, I would say that his background definitely has to come into play. I realize that there are people who have terrible histories, terrible backgrounds, and have turned their lives around 180, and it would be unfair to judge them based on old charges or crimes that they may or may not be guilty of, but we also need to consider it from the perspective of the officer who has been called to this situation, that there is a possibility that this could get violent. So, yes. Yeah, the officers were actually told that there's a warrant out for this man's arrest. Right. And if that's the case, the type of charges, you know, violating restraining orders, sexual assault. I think definitely that his background does play a role here. If it was a situation where the officers weren't prepped or given information on this man's background, you can make the argument that his background doesn't come into play, but the officers only can go off information that was given to them. They can't go off any other information. And if you have a history of resisting, he has a history of violent crimes, whether it's assault or forcing his way or his digits on a woman, that definitely come into play. And I know some people argue that he was actually trying to calm an argument between two women. Apparently I think his lawyers made that argument. I think he was probably between two of his lovers, probably former lovers probably. But I'm not hundred percent sure on that. But whatever the case may be he was still violated restraining order and his background is still his background. So the officers definitely would have to go off of that. And it doesn't help that you could clearly see in the full video where there was an initial scuffle where they tried non-lethal means and he brushed them off and he resisted arrest leading right up to his shooting. So do you think that they used excessive force against him? I've never been trained in the use of deadly force in terms of how to de-escalate a situation or how to escalate force based upon what you're seeing. Of course, common sense would tell me that if you want to stop someone, you don't necessarily need to shot them seven times. But at the same time, I've never been in a deadly force encounter where I had to use a firearm on somebody. And it's usually said that if you ask the experts, that they will say that you shoot not to kill, but to stop the threat. And clearly, what he was doing was actually a threat. You don't fight with police officers. They try to tase you. That didn't work. You don't fight with police officers and then walk away from them and go into a car. They can't see what you're going for in the car. He probably was going for his wallet. Maybe he was going for his wallet to show them his ID and show them he's not the guy that had a restraining order against him. You know, that's not what happened. But who knows what he was going back to the car for? The officers don't know what he's going to achieve from his car. It's, that is a very dangerous position for the officers. And they have a right to protect themselves. This thing where we have that you can do whatever you want to do and police should not defend themselves. They have a right to defend themselves. They want to go home to their families and their loved ones just like everyone else. Right. And you just don't know what someone is going to go to retrieve from the car. He was shot seven times or seven shots were fired. Also, you know, if you ask someone who was at or heard gunshots and they say, how many gunshots did you hear? And he asked five people. 
you hear a complete different number of gunshots. I remember I was at a fast food restaurant and gunshot went off and all of us went into the back and closed the doors and everything. And as we were talking, waiting for the police, I was saying I heard two shots. Some people were saying they heard three. Some people were saying they heard five. Up to this day, I don't know how many shots was fired. Was this here in the States or back in? No, this was here. Wow. Up to this day, I don't know how many shots were actually fired. But just to show you that I doubt that the officer say, you know what, I'm going to shot him seven times in his back. I can guarantee you that if he had asked that officer right after he shoot him, hey, how many shots did you fire? He probably wouldn't even know because he wasn't necessarily shooting and counting his shots or whatever. He was shooting to stop a threat against him, which was right. a legitimate threat. And I think that, you know, you don't fight with officers. You don't resist. You don't and go to the car. You know, recently I saw that there was a situation in Louisville or Louisville or whatever, how they say it in Kentucky. But it was a situation that happened after the Brianna Taylor situation with the Louisville Metro Police Department where the officer walked up to a young man, I think he was 18 at the time, the Cedric Binford, and he was in his car smoking weed. And the officer walked up to him and said, you know, hey man, what are you doing? I smell marijuana, whatever the case may be. And the officer said, do you have any more? He said, no. The officer said, you have smoke all of it? He said, yes. So the officer asked him to step out of the car. He did. And the officer would say, you know, do you have anything on you? He said, no. The officer asked him, do you mind if I look in the car? He said, no. The officer said, okay, I will look into the car as soon as my partner gets here. And while he was waiting for his backup to come, he and the officer were just having small talk, talking about the car and the situation. The officer asked him for his ID. He showed him his ID, showed him where he lived because he was parked on the street next to his apartment or the townhome, whatever they were at that point. And they were really having small talk. The officer was, you know, cool with him, really de-escalate the situation. And for the first three minutes of the video, you might think that, the officer, that's a textbook way of de-escalating and talking to someone who you potentially might have to arrest anyway. But it was a very cordial, civil conversation. And as they were talking, talking about cars and all these things, the Cedric asked the officer if he can go back into his car to retrieve some stuff. Officer was being cool. He said, yes, sure, you can go back in the car. And this Cedric went back in the car, and this Cedric is a black young man. Officer was white. And this Cedric went back into the car, searched for what he was searching, and pulled a gun. And they start struggling for the gun. The Cedric shoot the officer in his shoulder. Officers returned fire, got a shot. I think they hit him like twice, one in the chest. Both survived. The officer survived. The Cedric survived. But I'm telling that situation because this wasn't on the major news network like CNN and Fox and all these major network. No, it wasn't because the officer did a good job de-escalating the situation and was being cool and made a mistake and allowed the young man to go back into his vehicle. Being a little too trusting. Yeah, definitely. Being definitely way too trusting, allowing the young man to go back in his vehicle not be, uh, being able to see what he was grabbing from his vehicle, I ended up I got shot. So I said all this because there's no way the officer should just allow Jacob Blake to go back in his car. That's too dangerous. That's way too dangerous. And even though hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say, but even though afterwards you realize, hey, there were no weapons in Jacob Blake car, it's way too dangerous, especially after fighting with someone, to allow them to go back in their vehicle and you don't know what they have in their vehicle. So if you compare and contrast this Cedric situation with Big Jacob Blake, you can realize this is a dangerous situation Absolutely. to allow someone to go back in their car, especially a car that you haven't cleared or a waste. An officer didn't even check his waistband or anything. Right. So, and I'm saying, I think the officer did a good job, but the officer did fail in not securing him, allowing him to go back in his car. But if he had done that, and, oh, well, he haven't done anything, blah, blah, blah. He's been targeted because he's black. But then a civil conversation, and he went and got a gun to shoot the officer. Now he's being charged with attempt murder on a police officer. And, again, to bring that to Jacob Blake, there's no way you can say that it's cool for an officer to allow someone to go and search a vehicle 
that they don't know what they have in there. It's unfair to send an officer into a situation that he doesn't know what's going on. Everybody has a heightened sense of everything that's going on. Number one, the scuffle. And number two, there was obviously a fight or something between the women before the police arrived. Now you've got this unknown man with this background and he's reaching into his car and the officer has no idea what he's reaching for. It's unfair to tell the officer, you just need to chill out. You just need to be cool because now his life is in jeopardy. His life is in danger. I think you could see in the case with Bensford, is that what it is? Yep. That officer tried to be cool. And I think perhaps in the back of that officer's mind, he was aware of the heightened sensitivity with Brianna Taylor's situation having just happened, public sentiment being somewhat against police. Maybe he was trying to be sensitive to the entire situation and it could have cost him his life. He was hit in the shoulder. Had that bullet been any lower or, or maybe even more to the left of his chest cavity, that bullet could have killed him. It could have cost him his life. So I would agree that I don't think that excessive force was used against Jacob Blake, particularly in light of everything that we now know about it. I do realize that when it just happens, everyone likes to jump on it and have an opinion and, oh, this is just, you're targeting black people again, yet another, yet another, yet another. But then when the facts come out, then you realize it's not as targeted or racially motivated as you might think. There are real issues at play here, namely the safety of the police officer, whether or not the suspect is complying. complying. And other extenuating And the sicker- safety of the others around. Yes. Because if a gunfight should ensue, you're putting the citizens and the other people around at risk as well. Yes, so, bullets are flying everywhere, right? right? So was right. excessive force used? Quite honestly, I don't know. Here's something to consider. Some people, and I think this stems from a lack of understanding of weapons. Some people will say, oh, Jacob Blake had a knife. He had a gun. A gun will beat a knife every single time. Why does he need to shoot? Why does he need to fire? So they would make that argument in saying that perhaps the police use excessive force. And I don't think people realize if you've got a knife versus a gun, anything 21 feet and less, more than likely the knife wins. People don't realize that you can cover 10 feet of distance in one second. So if a police officer has a gun and the suspect has a knife, the suspect can close the distance between him and that police officer in two seconds and inflict a deadly wound faster than the cop can actually get his gun out. So a lot of people who make the argument that, oh, Jacob Blake just had a knife. What's a knife versus a gun? They don't realize that distance has something to play in this scenario as well. Anything 21 feet or less, if you've got a knife versus a gun, more often than not, 21 feet or less, the knife wins. Well, the knife has the potential to Has the win. potential to win. But right. also, we are asking our police officers to go into situations that we don't expect them to protect themselves from. Of course, they should protect themselves. Absolutely. Because as a civilian, I can decide, well, police are civilians too, but as a person who is not a sworn police officer, if I come up on a situation, I can decide whether or not I'm going to get involved in that situation or not. You know, if I'm in a situation where... I hear gunshots or something, I can remove myself away from the situation. So, for instance, the situation I was in where I was at a fast food place and gunshot went out, I didn't run around and see, hey, let me see what's going on. I went away from the situation. But we're asking our police officers to go towards the situation, which they did. When the police showed up, they came towards the situation. They didn't decide to go in the back of the building and wait. They went into situations. So if we're asking them to put their lives in that kind of situation, we must also ask them to protect, protect themselves. themselves. Absolutely. Because they definitely have a right to protect themselves. I'm not saying that there's no bad police officers out there. I'm just simply saying the fact is that if there's a fire, I'm running away from the building. The firefighters are going to come. They're going to run into the building. You remember that situation we had when we were living in an apartment complex where we had this strong order of gas yeah, in the, in, gas in the unit and i remember we came home from church and there was this strong smell of gas in the units and i took my wife and my son at that time and you know what i did i went out of the we'll building of there. i secure my family i went out of the building we called 911 the police came the firefighters came you know what they did 
they went into the building. We would never ask them to do that without the proper protection, without the proper gear. Exactly. So I'm just simply saying we're asking police to put themselves in a situation that we ourselves at times are not willing to go into. I'm not running towards gunfire unless my wife and kids or something is where the gunfire is coming from. Right. But they're doing that for strangers. They're running towards gunfire for strangers. So if we're asking them to do all that, we must also ask them to defend their life. Yes. Because Let's give Jacob Blake the benefit of the doubt. And let's say he was trying to calm down two women, as this lawyer or who's ever said. And I come up on Jacob Blake, trying to calm him down or calm the situation down, and he walk away from me, I can just move on, you know? But the officers can't walk up on someone who has a warrant for, out for their arrest, who has just violated their restraining order, and decide, well... We're just going to leave him alone. No, they have to arrest him. And if you're resisting, then they have to use more force to arrest you because they can't just leave you. So you're putting the officers in a situation that they have to use more force. And if you're going to resist, also bear in mind that more force is going to be used against you. You have to use force to arrest someone anyway. If you're going to resist, they're going to use even more force. And sometimes that force might even turn to deadly, deadly force. force. Still to come, we will discuss whether compliance would have changed the circumstances surrounding the situation. We'll be right back. Sometimes, no matter how great the selection, you just can't find exactly what you want. Design It Yourself custom gift baskets solve that problem by allowing you to choose the specific products you want to include with your unique gift basket. And in addition to hand selecting the products, you can further personalize your custom basket by adding coffee mugs, stuffed animals, mylar balloons, or even an imprinted ribbon. When you're done, we'll put it all together in a one of a kind, perfect basket and ship or hand deliver it directly to your lucky recipient. Click in the description section to design your basket today. A lot of the situation that goes haywire with black person interaction with police appears to go that way because the person was resisting arrest. What are some of the values of compliance can we buy from all these situations? What are some of the values of compliance? How about your life? <laughs> <laughs> Consideration for people who care for you, who are genuine. Like, look at the situation with Jacob Blake. The people or the person who called the police on him, they might have had a tiff of some sort, but I'm sure she's not wishing any sort of malice on him. I'm sure she cares about him or loves him. I don't know the situation. Why not comply in order to de-escalate the situation and not put her in a position to worry about whether or not the cops are going to kill you because you're reacting in resistance? Another value, in Jacob Blake's case, he had three children in the car with him. What about your children? Don't you want to, you know, live to see another day, live to fight another day? What about them? What about the example that you're setting for them in terms of how to interact with the police? Are you teaching them the truth about how compliance will buy you time? It might buy you de-escalation? Or are you reinforcing what the media is already trying to lie to them about, that the police are after them? and that everything they do is going to be scrutinized and there's no way they can win. So many values can be bought by compliance. And in Jacob Blake's situation, I don't know how much of it was a defiance that comes from, well, I'm a man and you're a man and you're not going to treat me this way, or how much of it was genuine misunderstanding or, or fear. genuine fear is another one. Compliance, though, will ameliorate all of those things. With compliance, you can fight your battle in the courts where it ought to be fought, not on the side of the road where you have armed police officers and you may not come out on the winning side of that fight. Compliance will buy you the chance to fight another day. Compliance will buy you a de-escalation of force. Compliance will calm everyone down and not feed into the hype and hysteria that we have in this country surrounding policing black people or the policing of black people. So there are many values to complying. And I think a little bit of forethought, wisdom, a little bit of humbling yourself 
will allow you to experience and enjoy the benefits of, for lack of a better expression, being alive. I don't think your life is worth you beating your chest or proving yourself on the side of the road with an armed police officer. Yeah, definitely. Another one that I would say that, of course, resistant arrest is against the law. So if you resist arrest, that's another attack on charges that will be against you by resisting because I could be wrong, but I don't know of anyone who have resisted arrest and the officer or the officers just simply say, well, he's resisted, let's move on. I've never seen that happen. And if the number of officers is not there that can help bring you in and bring you to justice, they're going to get more people to come and they're going to get more people to come. The only way out for you is if the community turn against the police. And I don't think that's going to happen. So unless there's a some kind of war between the, the people and the police and everyone take up arms against the police officers, then at some point or another, you're going to be arrested unless you escape and become a fugitive someplace, whatever. But right. let's say most of the time, 99% of the time, the officer is not going to just give up and say, oh, we're going to leave you alone. They're going to arrest you and there are going to be a bunch of other attack on charges from resisting to assault of a police officer who knows? There are going to be a bunch more charges attacked. You said, of course, living to fight another day. Of course, you can't fight injustices if you're dead. Right. So <laughs> comply and live to fight another day and fight it in court. You know what I'm saying? Of course, again, not being shot by the police. But also, I think it shows us civility. Can we be civil with each other? The police officers doing their job, whatever case may be, civil with each other. You don't have to be fighting and cursing and doing all the time all the time. It'd be civil. It's an arrest. And also, it shows respect for the rule of law. Yes. There's a value that you say, you know what, I have respect for the rule of law, and I'm going to comply with the authority of the officer. I remember, I don't remember how long ago now, but a few years ago, I think it's like five, six years ago now, that I got pulled over. I was coming off of one highway and merging onto another, and at about one second after I pulled onto the highway i was pulled over i personally thought it was unfair i didn't think i was speeding i didn't think that the officer should have pulled me over at that moment because i just got in the highway so there's no way i could have gotten up to speed that fast and stuff like that but did i tell the officer that no the officer came up the officer told me i was speeding we talked a little bit i was respectful i gave him what he want and When he gave me the ticket, you know what I said to him? Thank you. I actually thank him for the ticket. But I knew right away that a court day was coming up. I knew a court day was coming up. And you know what I noticed from going to court? I was on the left, I was on the right. And for that amount of time in the court, we were equal. It was no longer that you have authority over me and you're going to do this to me. The judge was in charge and you and I now are basically equals. And the judge asks you what happened. Then the judge turned to me and asked, well, the judge asked me, how do I plea first? Of course, I plead not guilty because I wasn't guilty. Well, who knows? (laughs) Maybe I was. But whatever the case may be, the judge asked me, how do I plea? The judge asked the officer what happened. Judge asked me what happened. And the judge kicked the case out. I didn't even have to pay a court fee. Nothing. Well, you know, he took up some of my time because my last name is way down in the alphabet and I had to sit through an hour and a half of other people that have names with higher letters in alphabet. But other than my time sitting there, I went to court and I fight the battle in court because I don't think I was fairly pulled over. But I didn't fight it to the police officer because he was just doing his job. And I was simply saying, you know, I understand this situation was a little bit more intense than a traffic stop or pullover for speeding. But I'm just simply saying, Compliance will buy you the time to go to court and fight your battles. Again, the justice system is not perfect, but it's one we have, and it's better than the many around the world. So definitely, compliance definitely buys you a lot of benefits, including the ultimate one of surviving. How many of these incidents that we see in the news do you think could have been prevented If the person complied, like, for example, we see a lot of situations in the news where the person resisted or they fought back in many cases. 
the police shot them dead, and then it becomes an uproar. How many of those situations could have been prevented by compliance, do you think? Yeah, some of them weren't shot dead. Some were, some weren't. And I have a whole long list of names here that I believe, and this list is not exhaustive, but I wanted to get a lot of them just to show, especially the black community, which I am black, that a lot of these situations could have been prevented by compliance. And in the names I'm going to call, I'm not passing judgment on the police officer, nor on the quote-unquote victim, so to speak. I'm not saying that anyone did anything right or wrong. That's not what I'm passing judgment on. I'm passing judgment on the fact that if the person had complied with a police officer, I personally believe that the situation would have turned out differently. And the first one I'm going to talk about is Eric Gardner. Eric Gardner, the gentleman in New York who was choked to death, so to speak, by police officers, probably would have been live today if he had complied. The reason why the officer put him in a chokehold is because he was resisting arrest. Again, I'm not passing blame on whether the officers were wrong or right. I'm just saying, Eric Gardner, I believe personal situation would have been different if he had complied. How about that lady in Texas, Sandra, Sandra Blanc, or Blanc? I'm not quite sure how you pronounce her last name, but she probably would have survived if she didn't resist as well. You know, she reportedly committed suicide in jail, but I don't think the offense that she did because it was like changing lanes without, indi- without, a sig- without indicating. I remember shortly after that situation happened, I was driving behind a police officer and I was driving behind him for like a minute or two. And I saw that police officer repeatedly change lane without putting on his signal. Like moving from the right to the left and back to the right, back to the turning lane, back to the right. And of course, I don't know what he was doing, but his emergency light wasn't on and he was just driving as far as I can tell. But he was changing constantly without indicating. So to me, that was petty. But at the same time, compliance would probably would have not caused her to be thrown into jail. Into jail. That, that's just a ticket, you know? Right. But so it, it, to me, even though I don't want to get into full details of all of it, I believe that she would probably would have still been alive today and maybe not have committed suicide reportedly if she had just complied. How about Michael Brown in Ferguson? The officer asked him to come out of the median or the middle of the road. And he fought with the officer. I think Michael Brown probably would have been alive today if he had complied. You know, I don't think it was a situation where the officer drive up on him and say, oh, there goes a young black man. I'm going to provoke him so I can shoot him. I'm not even sure the officer was out to get him. He was just in the neighborhood and told him to get out of the road or get out of the median. Right. Even though he was wanted for strong arm robbery earlier. I don't even yeah, think that. a the, few minutes earlier. Right. So I think Michael Brown is another one. How about Freddie Gray in Baltimore? I think Freddie Gray would have probably still have been alive as well if he had not resisted arrest. You know, there's some controversy around how he actually died, whether they failed to secure him in the back of the van, whether he was actually showing himself around and he caused the damage to his body that did. But Freddie Bray probably would have stood alive if he had not with his arrest, run from the officers and all the other stuff that he did. How about Rashad Brooks? Happened last year in Atlanta. Fought with officers and the officers were actually pretty good to him up until they told him that he was going to be on arrest. Fought with officers, grabbed their tasers, fired a taser at him. He's probably was still alive. He have not resisted arrest. How about George Floyd, again, in Labor Day of last year? Probably would still have been alive if he did not resist arrest. Again, I'm not casting blame on the victim or anything. Right. Some of these, I actually believe the police were wrong. And some of them, I believe the police was right. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm just simply, based upon just the value of compliance alone, some of these, are all of them, I believe, actually will still be alive. George Floyd, I think, was still alive if he had not resisted. And we know that also because his friends who were there with him were telling him stop resisting. And they weren't shot or they weren't having a knee in their neck because they weren't resisting. So I believe George Floyd definitely would have still been alive. And of course, I'm going to cap it off with Alton Sterling in Bataroon, Louisiana. He was selling CDs and DVD, and he resisted arrest. I believe he too would have been alive if he did not resist arrest. That's not an exhaustive list, but I'm sure if I took a minute, I can find more that 
to still have been alive, if they just follow the value of compliance, they would still be alive today. And as you've said many times, this is not to excuse any sort of situation where police behavior is questionable. That's not the point. The point is de-escalation is the responsibility of everyone involved, not just the police officer. So as a civilian or as someone that's a suspect in a police encounter, don't escalate the situation by resisting. Don't escalate the situation by refusing to comply. And when I think about that, I have to wonder, or at least the question begs, what does compliance look like to a police officer? Well, of course, we're not police officers, so right. we don't know exactly what compliance is to a police officer. But based on looking at all of these things, if I was a police officer, what would compliance look like to me? How about what we have been talking about over and over? How about don't resist arrest? And that goes passively or actively. One of the the nastiest way to, well, maybe not the nastiest, but passive resistance is as dangerous as active resistance. I don't think that because you're passively resist, meaning you decide you're not going to talk to the police officer, but you're not being violent towards them, so to speak, that is any better than if you fire a punch at them. If the police officer is to get down and put your hands up and you're just not complying at all, passively resisting, I think that's just as dangerous as actively resisting. Why do you think that? Because, again, the police officer is not going to say, oh, well, well, this one is not complying. Let's move on to the other one. Oh, like the situation doesn't go away just because right. you passively... Uh, I right, understand. it doesn't. So passively resisting, to me, is as dangerous as actively resisting. Active resisting might get you shot faster, but the situation is not going to go away because you decide you're going to resist arrest. Also, another one, keep your hands visible. Let the officers see your hand. I know they have this false thing after Michael Brown, hands up, don't shoot, but that wasn't true. And we know that. Right. Multiple witnesses said that wasn't true. But keep your hands visible. And I would say even by extension... Also, your waistline, because that's where most of the weapons are coming from. Do not be reaching or searching for anything without permission from the officer. So don't be going to your glove compartment trying to find your insurance. Don't be looking in the center compartment trying to find this. Keep your hands visible. Don't be searching around for anything without permission from the officer. No one told me this, but when I got pulled over, the officer asked me for my insurance. And I said, officer is in the glove compartment. Can I get it? Sure. I go and get it. I'm not really going to be digging around in my glove compartment because the officer don't know what you're looking for. So don't be searching around for things. And also, obey the officer lawful command. Again, fight your battles in court. Obey the officer lawful command. The officer will say to get up, get up. The officer will say get down, get down. The officer will say put your hand behind your head. Whatever lawful command, I will say obey the officer. If your constitution rights is being violated, in today's heightened political world, sue the department and get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Fight it in court. And I know it might be difficult because some people might say they don't have money to get a lawyer and stuff like that. Well, all these people that profit, like the the Crump guy or whatever his name is. Benjamin Crump. That profit from these things. Maybe he should also be telling the everyday people to, hey, don't resist. If a constitutional rights are being violated, I'll fight for you in court. But we only see him, well, at least I only see him when someone dies, which is tragic. I would tack on to that. Realize that police officers are human too. Like the same way you want them to respect and honor you and to respect your personhood, realize that they are people too. If it's an escalation of force for the police officer to be swearing, be civil. Don't start swearing and mouthing off toward the police officer. Just be respectful and be courteous. It's not an ideal situation. There's no need to make it worse by using language or verbal abuse. There's an MMA fighter that I'm not particularly fond of, but he's had many run-ins with the law. And in one particular instance, he was driving, I believe he was inebriated. He had maybe hit another car where a pregnant woman broke her arm or whatever, and just the verbal abuse coming from his mouth. 
he was in the wrong and still behaving as though he could just talk to officers any kind of way you like. And some people will say that you can't tell me how to talk. Well, true. But realize that in the same way, officers using language is an escalation of force. You using language and verbal abuse can be perceived as an escalation of force as well. So don't do it. Just be polite and courteous. Live to fight another day. Fight it in court. That's another way to show compliance. I think it's important to say it doesn't demean you as a person. It doesn't diminish your worth to comply. I think perhaps many people, particularly in the Black community, perhaps feel that compliance somehow makes them less of a person, less of a man, less of a woman if they comply. And I don't think that's the case. This is purely trying to de-escalate a situation, trying to make the best of a bad situation all the way around. Both of you are caught on the worst day of your life ever. Let's not make it any worse than it needs to be. Right. So from that, we can see they have a lot of value in compliance. Also, just know there's some stuff that common sense will tell you not to do. The officer can't see your hands. That might be is to keep your hands visible. The officer don't know what they have in the gov compartment, don't know what they have in the center console. So definitely. So there's definitely some value of compliance. And I would encourage anybody that is interacting with police officers in official capacity to comply with the officer. But the question begs, though, is there any a time that we should not comply with police officers? If there is ever a time where the police officer is forcing, threatening, or requiring you to do something that is A, illegal, or B, unbiblical, I would say do not comply. And when I say do not comply, that does not mean throw a fit, become a threat, yell and punch and scream. It just means that you can respectfully refuse to do what he's telling you to do. For example, if you are, let's say, a woman and you've been pulled over by a male police officer who has unlawfully solicited sexual favors or things like that from you in order to make your case go away or to let you go scot-free, do not feel pressured to comply. That is illegal. There are things that you can do in order to go through the appropriate channels to report that officer, but I don't think in that situation you ought to comply. If the officer is having you do something unbiblical, I personally would not comply, and I would encourage Christians to do the same. But again, non-compliance doesn't necessarily mean violence. It doesn't necessarily mean threats. It doesn't necessarily mean being passively aggressive or to be passively resisting As you mentioned before, it simply means verbalizing to the police officer what you have asked me to do or what you have told me to do is A, sinful, B, illegal, explain why you're not doing it, making that clear, and trust the Lord to fight for you. He will honor that. I can confidently say that the Lord will honor that because, again, we love our police officers. We are grateful for them. We need them. We support them, but they are fallen, sinful men and women just like us. And you may find yourself in a position where they are requiring you to do something unlawful or illegal or unbiblical. And I think in those situations, we should not comply. Yeah, definitely. There are situations where I would say that it is okay not to comply with the police officer. And these have to be unlawful commands by the officer but that's a dangerous ground though because if you go back to some of these cases that i just mentioned earlier a lot of these folks felt like the officers were giving them unlawful commands so they resist without knowing the law ah great point so it's a slippery slope in that way if you're not a lawyer and even if you're a lawyer i guess oh you just don't know the law you believe you know the law compliance might still work in your favor and fight it in court. But of course, I also think that there are definitely some things that 
are so egregious that you know it is illegal. Right. You know, sexual flavors, buy me some liquor or buy me anything and I will let this go away. Give me some money. You know, we know all those things are legal. Those things are just, those things smell to the high heavens. Right. You know, but stuff like whether or not you should come out of your car, come out of the car if the officer asks you to come out of the car. Stuff like that, whether or not you should put out your cigarette, put out your cigarette. Those are not things you fight over. Whether or not it's legal or not for the police officer to ask you to do those things, those things are simple enough that you can simply comply without escalating it to a situation of non-compliance. But of course, there are things that are out there that you know definitely the police officer is going on a power grab and you can definitely, clearly, anybody, but probably even a child could know that, hey, that's wrong. So I would say yes, but I also want to be careful because a lot of folks believe they know the law, but they don't really know the law. You know, I think Sandra in Texas was one of those people that the police officer asked her to come out of the car and she said, oh, I don't have to come out. Police officer asked her to put out a cigarette. Oh, I don't have to do it. Those are the simple enough stuff. Like Michael Brown, get out of the road. It's simple stuff that he can comply with. Whether or not it's legal or not for the police officer to tell you that, to me, is irrelevant. But of course, there are sit times when I think the police officer can overstep their legal bounds. And when it's clearly so, you can decide not to comply. A situation that happened in Two Word, Pennsylvania, where the chief, actually the chief of police, when he pulled over folks, he will check, and this will be women, he will check and see if they have felony charges against them or any outstanding warrants or whatever the case may be. And if upon checking these women and they have felony charges against them, he will actually take them to a second location and tell them, I can make this go away if you do such a trust for me. And there are at least two women who actually comply with a sexual favor that he was asking for because they didn't want to get arrested because they feel fearful. In situations like that, you don't need to comply. You don't need to be a lawyer to know that that's wrong. But other minor stuff, to me, what is right and wrong, fight it in court. But stuff like that, definitely resist. Definitely peacefully say, hey, no, you can take me to jail, you can do whatever, but I'm not going to do that illegally. And today, with the advancement of technology, you can record him saying you those sure things. You sure can. The yeah. moment he walks up, you can you have know, a video on him, you can recording. have a voice record on him because he's a public figure. You can definitely record him. And if he slip up, that's evidence in court. Again, fight your battles in court. So if you're one of those persons that are fearful of police officers, I would say simply record them. If you want to have dash cams on your car or you use your phone or whatever case may be do that but as much as you can comply until it comes to a point like what we see in steward pennsylvania where the chief of police was doing these illegal activities thank god he has been caught but definitely when they're time not to comply i believe the times when they're not to comply is usually very clear the gray areas of whether or not you should come out of the car or whether or not you can order everybody to come out of the car and all these things, it's just best to comply. Right. So let me ask you this. What parallels and what contrasts do you see between Jacob Blake's lack of compliance and Christ's pending return? Those two seem like they're completely different things, but do you see any contrasts or parallels between the two? Yeah, I actually do. You know, when you think of complying, compliance gives the idea of a choice. You can either respect this officer and I'm going to comply to his commands or whatever the case may be. But you also can do it, you know, kind of unwillingly. You know, if you have to ask you to come out, you can do it unwillingly. If you actually going to put you under arrest, you can follow his commands unwillingly. But the Bible teaches that we'll not only have to comply with Christ, but one day, we're going to have to be willingly submitted to him. So, submitted to his lordship. I think about what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, this Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, taught him not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant 
and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, and things on the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. My friends, one day, listener, one day, you will have to bow to Jesus and confess him as Lord. You can do that now, and he'll be your savior, or you can do it then, and he'll be your judge. Which one do you want Christ to be for you? Your savior or your judge? If you face him as a judge, the Bible declares that you are already condemned. I think about John chapter 3 and verse 18, where the Bible says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is a condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. My friends, if you're not saved, dear listener, if you're not saved, the Bible said that you are condemned already. Christ will one day be your judge. But he doesn't have to be that way. He could be your savior. We look at John 3, 18, but what about John 3, 16 and 17? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What I'm saying here is that one day, when you face God, you can bow your knee to him now and confess that you're a sinner and confess that he is Lord and Savior of your life, repenting of your sin and turning to Christ, or one day, He'll be your judge. The Bible said in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you have a choice before you. You can either choose your sin and face Christ as your judge or you can choose Jesus Christ and face him as your savior which one would you choose would you trust him today thank you for listening to get a hold of us or to support this podcast go to anchor.fm forward slash removing barriers this has been the removing barriers podcast we attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross